Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of The Secret Life of Bletchley Park by Sinclair Mackay. So this is subtitled The World War II Code Breaking Centre and the Men and Women Who Work There. Bletchley Park is where they cracked the Enigma code. It's where Alan Turing was based, the father of computing. I've actually visited it with my mum as well, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb. I'm going to go through and check out some of my sticky tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... Bletchley Park's cracking of the Enigma Code was one of the greatest achievements of the war. Now, for the first time, here are the stories of the ordinary men and women who made it happen. At the secret code-breaking centre of Bletchley Park, debutantes, factory workers, students and wrens were thrown together with Britain's most brilliant brains, united in work of almost unbearable intensity and even greater importance. But there was far more to their days and nights than the long hours spent decrypting enemy messages. From world-class concerts by visiting musicians and amateur dramatics to ice skating on the frozen lake and furtive romances sealed down quiet country lanes. Sinclair Mackay's acclaimed book reveals what life was really like for the young people whose clandestine efforts were instrumental in winning the war. So, we'll start with reporting for duty. So I like this because I'm a big Graham Greene fan and he says, There is perhaps a touch of the Graham Greene thriller about this image. The steam train drawing away, its red rear lights disappearing into the black distance. Then a thick silence broken only by the click of solitary footsteps pacing in the deep shadows of an unlit platform, waiting for the mysterious contact to arrive. And that was what it was like to go to Bletchley when they were first summoned there. We get this line, trains during the war were often jammed and people would often have to sit on their suitcases in the corridors and try to do without the lavatories, which were gothically horrible. Not much has changed then. That just sounds like me trying to go back to visit my mum in Tamworth. So here we're learning about uh, Dilly Knox, who is one of the, I guess one of the leaders, you know. He was actually like a World War I code-breaking veteran. Uh, as a boy, Dilly had precociously detected a number of inaccuracies, even downright contradictions in the Sherlock Holmes stories, wrote Fitzgerald, and sent a list of them to Conan Doyle in an envelope with four dried orange pips in allusion to the threatening letter in the sign of four. And uh, we get, as a security precaution, all personal posts had to be sent to Bletchley Park via a London PO box. This postal system broke down, according to Cooper, when a relative of one code breaker attempted to send a grand piano. Yeah, that would do it. And uh, this guy Cooper, Josh Cooper, uh, one of the code breakers, we get Cooper's own recollections fail to include his own spectacular bouts of eccentricity, such as the later occasion, recalled by another veteran, when Cooper was present at the interrogation of a captured German pilot. When the pilot gave out a Heil Hitler, Cooper inadvertently did the same, and in his haste to sit down after this embarrassment, ended up missing the chair and falling under his death. So these couple of paragraphs tell you a lot about Alan Turing and the kind of person he was. The portrait we appear to be presented with is one of a classic borderline Asperger's boffin. His eccentricities have been well rehearsed. Among them was his bicycle, with a chain that was poised to fall off after so many rotations, which meant that Turing had to calculate exactly the moment at which to start moving the pedals backwards to avert this. And he had the habit of cycling around the countryside while wearing a full gas mask. Yet, perhaps there was a logical advantage in having a bicycle that no one else would know how to use without the thing falling to bits. And the simple fact was that Turing suffered badly from hay fever. The gas mask was a practical, if drastic, solution to the difficulty. And this was interesting. Um, so efficient did Bletchley become in handling this material, wrote Eileen Clayton, that there were even cases where, during poor conditions for reception, the German recipient of a signal was obliged to ask the sender for the message to be repeated, whereas our listening stations had recorded it fully the first time. This placed British intelligence in the position of knowing the contents of a signal before the intended recipient. And this was fascinating, I didn't know this. The operatives of Hut 6 rapidly succeeded in doing so. Within days, the Air Ministry was receiving vital information concerning potential raids and a number of bombers that might be involved. Thanks to Enigma, as Oliver Lorne explains, the Air Ministry also had the wherewithal to bend the German navigation beams, thereby causing the planes to drop their loads in the wrong places. One of the things the Germans used the Enigma machine for in the early stages of the war was directing their bombing of British cities, beam bombing. That's an aeroplane going along a beam and another beam being set to cross it. And that was the point at which they dropped their bombs over the centre of the city. Now, there was a code which set the angles of the beams. And if you could break the code, clever engineers could bend one of the beams so that the crossing point was over green fields and not over cities. And this is sinister. Another bomb landed in the stable yard, just yards away from the cottage where Dilly Knox and Mavis Lever were at work on the Italian naval enigma. This bomb, however, failed to go off. A couple of others apparently fell and failed to go off as well. They're still somewhere in the grounds of the park, though no one is quite sure where. And on the subject of Mavis Beatty and Dilly Knox, Mrs Beatty recalls with a smile how Knox was brilliant at getting people to look at problems from unexpected angles. Dilly would ask, which way do the hands on a clock go round? One might say clockwise. But Knox would reply that it would depend upon whether one was the observer or the clock. And we get a reference to Colin Grazier, uh, who was from Tamworth. And uh, basically, 
Let's, well, let's read this out. The U-boat's crew had abandoned the ship. The vessel was sinking. By the time Lieutenant Anthony Fass and an able seaman Colin Grazier swam to it, followed by 16-year-old Tommy Brown, only its conning tower was visible above the waves. Despite the fact that the U-boat was about to be submerged, Fasten and Grazier boarded the vessel. Some lights were still on inside, and what they found was the four-rotor Enigma machine that had defeated Bletchley, along with a book of the current shark keys. With astounding presence of mind, the pair ensured that both the Enigma machine and the keys in the Bigram tablets were wound securely in waterproof material. They passed the machine and the books to Tommy Brown, who was outside. He in turn passed them to fellow crew members in a whaleboat. But it was too late for Fasten and Grazier. U-559 sank, taking them with it into the depths. They had given their lives so that this information could be passed back. Both men were posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross, while Tommy Brown received the George Cross. When the machine and the documents reached Bletchley Park a few weeks later, it at last became possible for the codebreakers to crack the shark key, and very shortly afterwards they did. After the dark months of code blackout, the naval enigma operation was back in business. And yeah, Colin Grazier came from my uh, hometown. There are like statues and memorials to him and stuff. And people uh, at Bletchley Park, they were so like, dedicated to secrecy and keep you know they signed the official secrets act but they knew how important their work was so it says there are stories of women who worked there who refused even to have medical operations carried out for fear of blurting indiscretions out under anesthetic uh, there's a reference to francis dashwood of west wickham park so i live in uh, wickham now and the dashwoods are like our local rich historic family i actually wrote about one of the dashwoods in my short story a stone's throw we get captain jerry roberts was furious um on behalf of Tommy Flowers, a British uh, computer guy, basically. Uh, he says, Dan Brown, author of The Da Vinci Code, wrote a book called Digital Fortress, and he says in that that the computer was invented at Harvard in 1944. Um, and that's because we delete, like we got rid of a lot of our official records and smashed up machines and stuff after the war, so people don't realize the part that the, the British played. And Mavis Beatty says that they were all into Freud, uh, that Pe Pelican published six penny editions of the psychopathology of every everyday life. If you'd been an undergraduate as we were, then you were pretty much bound to have had one. And I read that not too long ago. So yes, The Secret Life of Bletchley Park by Sinclair Mackay. Really fascinating stuff, especially if you, like me, are really into, like, you know, the history, the war, code breaking, all of that stuff. Lots of stuff to uh, learn about. But equally, it gives you a really good picture of exactly what it sounds like, of what it was like to live there at the time. So I gave The Secret Life of Bletchley Park by Sinclair Mackay a 3.5 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Secret Life of Bletchley Park by Sinclair Mackay. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.